Welcome to this evening's program focusing on the role of conflict management in policing sponsored by New York Law School's ADR skills program. A huge thank you to Peter Phillips, who spearheaded the efforts to bring us all together this evening. I'm Maria Volpe, and I will be serving as the moderator for this evening. Before we get started, I want to take care of a few important housekeeping matters, uh, including uh, the fact that this is a CLE program. I will be announcing three code words every 25 minutes for those attendees interested in receiving 1.5 CLE credits in professional practice. And that's the transitional and non-transitional uh, categories. Uh, please make a note of the words. And when the program is finished, click the link to bring up the form, put the words in the form and click submit to prove your continuing attendance during the program. The form was set sent in two different mailings, along with the link to this zoom call. Uh, the time frames will be approximately um, 555 620 and 645 at the conclusion of the program. We will be using the chat to um, take questions from the audience. So please um, write whatever questions or comments you have in the chat and we will be reviewing them during this session. Now the session. We deliberately chose to title this session Conflict Management instead of Conflict Resolution since in the context of police intervention work, it is a more accurate depiction of how police interface with conflict situations and how they use conflict skills. For police, their interventions often occur in real time when emotions are high, in public spaces with bystanders where many may be ready to record what's being said and done, and where the media is ready to report all of their interventions. And public officials and citizens are always ready to react. For most conflict resolvers, particularly mediators, such a context is the antithesis of their work that usually involves preparation of the parties, of their sessions, and are held in a private space where confidentiality is assured. Managing conflicts by police is like no other context. And many of us were reminded um, on January 21st how dangerous police work can be in managing a domestic situation when Jason Rivera and Wilbert Mora were shot uh, in Harlem. Over the years, when people shared with me that they would love to do conflict intervention work full time, I've often suggested considering police work as a career. I'm joined this evening by a panel of distinguished colleagues who bring a wealth of experience to this program. We will begin by each of us introducing ourselves and sharing our connection to policing and conflict management. Uh, I'm gonna be the briefest in these introductions of myself and then I will pass it on to my colleagues in alphabetical order. So, um, I will turn to Kirk Burkhalter, then Susan Herman, and then uh, Jeff Thompson. Currently, I'm a professor of sociology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice of the City University of New York, where I also direct the Dispute Resolution Program and the CUNY Dispute Resolution Center. Early on in my career, I was a really strong proponent of police being trained in mediation because I thought they would be invaluable skills for police officers to have, even if they didn't do mediation the way we think of mediation. We'll talk more about that during this program. Uh, early in my career, I was part of a training team at John Jay College that conducted uh, training for the emergency service unit officers after the Eleanor Bumpers case. Uh, in 1984, Eleanor Bumpers was an elderly, disabled African-American woman who was shot when police were called to enforce a city-ordered eviction 
from her public housing apartment. Uh, by the early 90s, that training was expanded to the hostage negotiation team. And I was part of the integration of both the ESU and the hostage teams uh, being trained. And that training has now been integrated into all police training. Over the years, I've done uh, a lot of research on the police use of mediation, its promises and challenges. I've facilitated a wide range of cops and kids dialogues with NYPD officers. And finally, uh, most recently, in the last week or so, I was funded by the American Arbitration Association International Center for Dispute Resolution Foundation, uh, along with Dan Bursting to conduct a national um, research project that will culminate with a um, online mental health communications resource platform, providing law enforcement with on-demand user-friendly tools for empowering interactions involving mental health issues and crises. Uh, initially, we'll be focusing on small and rural uh, law enforcement agencies in the US. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Susan. Susan, if you could share Susan with or us. Kirk. Kirk first. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking across my screen. I'm so yeah. sorry. Okay. I did say alphabetical order, Kirk. No, that's <laughs> quite all right. I'm, I'm totally used to it. It's the story of my academic life having a last name that begins with B, always going early in the line. <laughs> oh, uh, but thank you very much. Um, and it was a great introduction. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, my name is Kirk Burkhalter. I'm a member of the full-time faculty here at New York Law School. And I just want to give a big uh, shout out to one of our alum. I just happened to notice in the room, Ben Acosta. And we have many uh, distinguished <laughs> alum, and he certainly is one of them. So I just wanted to publicly say hi to him. So as I mentioned, I'm a member of the full-time faculty here at New York Law School. And just going uh, in order of my career, uh, I guess the, one of the reasons why I'm here is uh, I spent 20 years in the New York City Police Department. And um, during my career, I uh, actually worked uh, in Harlem at the 3-2 precinct, the same precinct that Maria mentioned where those officers uh, worked. As a matter of fact, my father worked at that precinct about 15 years prior uh, to me. He retired as sergeant. And both my father and I are alum of John Jay. So I hold a near, John Jay near and dear to my heart. My father received his undergraduate degree and his master's degree from there. And I received my under, undergraduate degree in forensic psychology. So throughout the course of my career in the police department, I worked in the 3-2 on patrol. I spent a few years in the narcotics division, uh, basically uh, doing uh, investigatory and undercover work. And I spent a, a lot of time uh, in my career in, I don't believe it still exists, in the Organized Crime Control Bureau, working in the narcotics division uh, and working in the organized crime division, and finally spending about eight years in the auto crime division. So I spent the majority of my career in the police department conducting long-term investigations, and at that time, uh, into traditional and non-traditional organized crime entities. And I finished my last six years of my career in the intelligence division, where I worked in the special services unit, uh, where my focus was primarily on counterterrorism. Uh, investigations. And um, I went to law school. I attended law school here at New York Law School during my last four years uh, in the police department. But before I even continue on, I'll say that uh, obviously, you know, my brother is uh, also a retired sergeant. My father's a retired sergeant. It's like kind of the family business. So, uh, but I'm a big fan of, um, I learned so much and I literally grew up on the police department. Uh, I joined the police department. When I was 21 years old. So very much uh, became an adult. And I think that feeds right into the subject matter here of uh, what police officers need in training and what occurs when they're not properly uh, trained in mediation and dispute resolution. Because I certainly uh, was not trained nor did I have the life experience as a 21 year old. I was very much still uh, living in my parents' home at the time. So I, um, I re retired, took the bar, started a new job all at the same time. And I worked for a brief time uh, in the corporate securities and finance group at Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman and uh, segued into academia where I have been for some time now. Here at New York Law School, I teach legal practice, which is a course uh, where we 
cover legal writing, uh, persuasive and predictive writing and negotiating, counseling, interviewing and legal research. And I also teach criminal law, uh, criminal procedure investigation. And finally, a course I developed entitled uh, Policing the Police, which I'm ecstatic to teach. And I uh, co-teach that with an alum of the school, Katie Smith, who's a civil rights litigator. And we're really just having a blast teaching the course. And I'm also the director of our 21st Century Policing Project. And it's a project that's geared uh, towards police reform. Now, when I say police reform, you know, there always seems to be, uh, my battle cry is there seems to be this concept that there's a zero sum game. You have civilians on one side, the police on the other side and reform, it means one person has to win and one has to lose. I think that our project focuses on uh, just the opposite, that this is not a zero sum game and in order for uh, everyone to win, uh, we have to consider kind of all different sides and certainly uh, a huge part of that is uh, the civilian populace. So I'm really pleased to be in this panel and I'd like to dig in a little bit to my experiences maybe in a little while when I was that 21 year old on the streets of Harlem trying to mitigate disputes from people twice my, <laughs> involving people twice my age. So uh, luckily uh, as uh, I'm sure Jeff will touch on, the police department are, uh, really arms its police officers far better uh, than I was armed in 1984. Thank you so much, Kirk. And sometimes they were more than double your age, probably <laughs> triple your age, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. More on that um, when we start digging in. Susan. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my career, interestingly, is sort of, I went the opposite direction as Kirk. I, um, I wanted to be a mediator growing up. That's all I ever wanted to be. I trained to be a mediator during college, before law school, during law school, after law school. Um, I did, I worked as a legal writing instructor and I taught criminal law, you know, sort of we've been in the opposite direction. And then I finally got to be a full-time mediator and I worked at the Institute for Mediation and Conflict Resolution for several years. But much of the work that I did there was training public sector employees in um, mediation and conflict resolution skills. So we trained um, housing authority managers and ticket enforcement agents and park rangers, but I got to train all of the community affairs officers in the NYPD, so hundreds of them. Um, and I got very interested in the NYPD. And then um, shortly thereafter was asked to review the entire academy curriculum to find places where de-escalation, communication skills, um, negotiation skills, anything that seemed like conflict management in any form, even physical, was taught in the academy. So we could identify all those places where police officers were being trained, analyze whether it was being done as well as possible and add to it where we thought it would be appropriate. We also designed a mediation process for the Civilian Complaint Review Board that now is in effect and has been for decades. Um, I was then recruited to come to the NYPD and work there full time. And um, I hadn't heard Maria's advice, but I did feel that way, that joining the NYPD, um, working for the police commissioners would be a way to think about and focus on conflict resolution all the time. Um, it would just take many different forms. So I've now done two stints at the NYPD, two five-year stints, one from 85 to 90, that's how young I am, and one from 2014 to 2019. And Dan Oates, who's on, of course I remember you. Um, so uh, I worked for five different police commissioners during that period. And the second stint really allowed me to um, focus a lot on conflict resolution. Um, we developed a referral process, a formal referral process so that officers could refer people to the five borough-based dispute resolution centers in New York. Um, and what that meant was 
opportunities where enforcement was not appropriate. There was a dispute that had two parties um, where officers felt that they fell within what the dispute centers, the kinds of situations that they were interested in handling, neighbor, neighbor disputes, barking dog, shared driveway, um, stores, shops that were next to each other, a range of things. And um, with the permission of the parties, they'd be referred to the dispute resolution centers and the centers would then call them and explain to them what mediation is all about and try and lure them to the dispute resolution centers. And that's always an art. Um, the second thing that I worked on and I really enjoyed was training the neighborhood coordination officers who are the kind of the central component of the neighborhood policing work that in my view is sort of community policing 3.0. Um, it's a very, it's a different kind, but it's the next evolution of community policing. And the, and the neighborhood coordination officers, unlike the community affairs officers, are tasked with enforcement as well as general problem solving. So they are considered in police lingo, they are definitely crime fighters. Um, and they are seen as working on problems with residents outside of a typical 911 environment. So not emergency work, something where is a long standing, but it is a crime or safety problem. So think of the building where people are complaining that drug dealers have taken over the stairwells. They're not really calling 911 for that, but it's certainly a crime and safety problem. Um, all of those NCOs were, and these are officers, the lowest rank of police officer, they're not sergeants or lieutenants, they're officers. And they were asked to facilitate community-based meetings. And I can assure you that officers in the NYPD, like in most police departments, are not used to going to public meetings and speaking, no less running them. It's usually somebody higher up that's doing that. Um, and they're also tasked with, as I said, engaging in collaborative problem solving with community members. And so we gave them not only training in meeting facilitation, which um, had many of the elements of conflict management because they had to learn how to work with all different kinds of people. These are agenda-less meetings where anybody can show up and voice any concern in any level of emotion that they want. And then we gave them 40 hours of standard mediation conflict resolution training offered by the Peace Institute. And we told them, as Maria said, um, you may get to do something that looks like classic mediation with two parties who agree to sit down and um, work on a future oriented agreement, you may but it's very likely that you won't, but you'll use these skills in everything that you do. And we trained hundreds of neighborhood coordination officers and all of them would say, as I'm sure all of you who are on this today, mediation skills help you not only dealing with the public and could help anyone who deals with the public, but they help you in your personal life. And that was sort of a revelation to all of these officers that wow, I'm learning how to talk to people in a different way. I'm learning how to listen in a different way. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into more questions, but there are two other things that I would just mention that are somewhat relevant. The second time I was at the NYPD, we also um, helped design but implement trauma-informed interviewing skills for all me members of the Special Victims Division people who are in, um, investigating sexual assault complaints. And this was, um, again, I think it's a second cousin of conflict management, but very much focused on trauma and what it does to memory and how someone communicates. Most recently, I served as the director of the mayor's office of community mental health. And while there helped design a four agency initiative called Be Heard, which is a health only response to 911 mental health emergencies. Um, and I mention that only because, um, again, the training there that the social workers and the EMTs have is very much about de escalation, communication, problem solving, assessment, and problem solving. So, so 
all these things, regardless of the names, they're all second cousins. They're all, they're all related. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Susan. She's done some amazing trailblazing work in uh, her many different uh, uh, situations and A lot of hats. hats that you've <laughs> worn uh, over the years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go on, since it's five, uh, almost 555, I'm going to give you the first. Um, you want Jeff oh, to do his thing? Well, I, we're supposed to give these codes every 25 minutes. Ah, sorry, we're sorry. at that point. Um, just about at that point, rather than interrupting Jeff, I'll do it before. The first code is police. <laughs> first code is police. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to a real police officer, <laughs> Jeff. Thank you, Maria, and hello, everybody. And I can't wait to find out what the next code word is going to be. So I'm sticking <laughs> around. I hope everyone else does. I yeah. I'm, I appreciate um, people joining in. You could be anywhere else right now, but you chose to come here. And let me first and foremost say that, sure, I'm absolutely here to share some of the work that I've been involved in, but also importantly, I'm here to listen to everybody. And it's that whole idea of, of course, especially in policing, there's moments for right and wrong, but also looking beyond that, it's um, quite often about learning and just trying to get better at what we do, no matter what our profession is. And I think it was um, Susan, you said it, or Maria, I'll give you both credit too. It's just um, one thing that came came to my mind a lot, and I'll explain it a bit more what I'm doing currently, but we're all human beings, every single one of us. And we have different professions. Mine happens to be in law enforcement. And it's that that's what it is that you said, Susan. It's that idea of these skills are not police skills. These mm -hmm. are life skills that happen to be applied by police and uh, plenty of other professionals. But these are really the skills that helps us be better humans when we interact with each other. And it's not limited to an employment, it's limited to living. And especially when we're home and our personal lives and interacting with people. So um, I'm currently, uh, my I have a few jobs. Uh, my law enforcement one is I'm an NYPD detective, nearly approaching my 20th year. I'm the department's first ever mental health and wellness coordinator. But going back to the early days, I started off, um, I was a recruit in the academy walked the beat, drove around in a patrol car. Then I worked in very specialized units in community, community affairs. I worked in our press office where I helped handle, talk about conflict communication. I'm on the day-to-day -day communication, but being um, involved directly with the communication between the NYPD and the public during three terrorist attacks and realizing how powerful conflict management skills are and talk about trying to manage personal stress when trying to communicate. I worked in a couple of other uh, specialized units. I was a hostage negotiator for a few years and I put and trained it as well. And just segueing to my current position as the mental health and wellness coordinator, the way I look at it is I think overall, police in general do a really good job of helping the, the public when they need it most, when they're in a crisis. I started to realize as I got more and more time on, we do a pretty crappy job of looking after each other and ourselves. And it was just awful. And a key component, which I didn't say too, it's the work I do in the NYPD and other police agencies is suicide prevention. And there's another term which people rarely talk about, but there's also something called suicide postvention. Postvention means unfortunately somebody died by suicide. And we have to make sure we learn as much as we can in those unfortunate situations to make sure everything we're doing is guided and grounded by research. So that kind of leads to the other thing I'll just say with the logo that I have above me, I'm also a research scientist at Columbia University Medical Center in their psychiatry department, where currently basically what I do is the research and the most brilliant people I've ever come across in Columbia help make sure any of the work that I'm doing in police and over with first responders or anywhere else, we share it to make sure it's evidence-based. Because for anyone on this line that's a lawyer, but also a cop, and I guess it's not just limited to police trainings, but Kirk could probably vouch for me. Sometimes people will give a talk and they pass their anecdotal story off as science. It doesn't work like that. The anecdotal story is supposed to bring to life the science and the data, but there's gotta be the data behind it. And I just, I, I, I guess I, I, I have plenty more that I, I wanna share later too, but I guess one thing I didn't add to is I've been involved in training um, for a very long time across the gamut in many different ways, but especially you look at it for an entire officer's career and starting with the recruit and then when they're a rookie, then while they're a seasoned veteran on patrol, but then also when they get promoted to lieutenant, sergeant, captain, or higher ranks. 
And again, although a lot of my work is currently dealing with the police, and I will throw it back to you in one second, Maria, it's the idea of which I am adamant about aside of the bringing back that mindset of the humanity that's involved in police and the police and dealing with the public, here's my key point here is if we want to make sure the police are good at what they do and what, what do they do? Protect the public. We've got to make sure they're good at taking care of themselves. And that's an absolute must. And the more we emphasize with all any sort of training or wellness programs or anything we do, we've got to make sure that it's part of police training too, because healthy cops are more efficient and effective. They're also more efficient and effective human beings. And this where I look forward to the discussion, I look forward to perhaps arguing, but I'd like to think that's something every one of us can agree on, that when cops are healthy mentally and physically, it makes them more effective at their job and that's protecting all of us. So Maria, back to you. I'm ready to get this going. <laughs> Thanks for reminding us of the human behind the blue that everyone associates with policing. So we have a series of questions and we're gonna skip around a bit so that we can cover um, some of what might be relevant in understanding the role of conflict management in policing. So uh, how about if we start with what is the police role when they show up? Is it as a law enforcer, conflict manager, both? Uh, where are the lines drawn? Where are they blurred? Who would like to, who would like to start? I'll give that a, I'll give it a quick, uh, give it a quick try. Uh, Susan, you mentioned Dan Oates. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you Dan Oates was my commanding officer in the intelligence division. He's a great person. He's a New York Law School alum. Wrote me a wonderful recommendation saying all types of things that weren't true to get me into <laughs> law school. So uh, don't worry, the statute of limitations has told on that. So, uh, but love it. It's great to see you, Chief. Great to see you. Um, you know, we were mentioning. Um, during our preparation for, for this discussion, I said I was happy to be the poster child for everything that one a police officer can do wrong with regards to uh, conflict management and so forth. But starting with that particular question, what's the, the expectation? You know, it's very interesting because that expectation, I think, is driven a lot by the public. Uh, you know, a lot of folks, there's a lot of discussion about what the police, the role of the police should be. Should the, you know, we uh, want the police to show up right under certain situations well that's twofold right to how to get there one is you know the police can certainly make that decision but the public still right now the culture is such that they do expect the police to show up and resolve problems you know how many folks pick up the phone and instead of calling 911 or 311 their first impulse is let me find a you know google a psychologist to talk to my child or, you know, and so forth, if, especially if it's something that they deem somewhat of an emergency. So by virtue of their role of first responders, police end up triaging a lot of what's going on. It's very difficult for a police officer to say, you know, I understand your problem. Here, just take this card, call Dr. So-and-so or whomever, or why don't you wait here? I'll call this agency. They should be here in about an hour while two people are at each other's throats. There's very much an expectation that when that person shows up in uniform, they are a problem solver. So on one side of the coin, you know, certainly I'm of a school that I do think in many instances, we ask our police to do too much because the reality is uh, you'd have to stay in the police academy about seven years to receive all the training, proper training that police, officer, uh, police officers are asked to do. However, conflict resolution, I mean, you, know, you think about dispute calls, uh, meaning disputes between significant others, between family members and so forth. Um, that is probably the majority of police work. Then there's the conflict that you engage in with the public, right? The police officer and the person uh, with whom they are dealing, someone that perhaps there you have to issue them a summons or perhaps it's you know, that day where you can't walk down this side of the street Sir or ma'am, may you have to cross the other side of the street. That's conflict. And that can become heated. And, and so just to go a little bit further, I also learned I could make a situation a lot worse by not really understanding some basic, uh, having a basic understanding of conflict resolution and even understanding if I was in, engaged in a uh, situation where I even had the ability 
even if I was trained to engage in some form of conflict resolution. Not You can't engage in that each and every time. Sometimes the parties have to cool down or be removed or whatever the case. So sometimes there's a crime that's been committed and we have gone far beyond this conflict resolution. So this is something that police officers do every day. As we are all sitting here, there are thousands of police officers at this moment engaging in some form of negotiation, conflict resolution, trying to get two parties, not so much to meet uh, eye to eye, but just to keep the peace, so to speak. It's an everyday battle. So it's certainly uh, sprinkled all throughout police work. But in answer to your question, it's twofold. One, our the civilian culture. We still very much live in a culture where you call the police and they can change everything. And then it's also you know what the department uh, the needs of the department or what the department deems as the mission or the role of policing kind of can't change one without the other I hope, that, I hope that's responsive yeah. to your question excellent points um and we know on a daily basis conflict makes the news but all those peace efforts that the police thousands of them engage in every day uh, go on quietly behind the scenes so um yeah we we don't have a way to amplify or highlight the kind of day-to-day -day work. Uh, other thoughts on, um, you know, are they law enforcement, uh, law enforcers? Are they conflict managers? Both lines get blurred, lines get drawn, where? Thoughts? Well, ahead, I'll, I'll just say one quick thing, Susan. If um, kind of add into like what Kurt said in just the mindset, and I know, um, there's some people on here that have heard me talk before, but I also see a lot of new faces too. And again, it's great to see both of those. The way the approach is that I take it, the way I was taught, but also now that I share it with people whenever they want me to share it with them is that mindset of conflict management. And I learned this first in, uh, I was first trained as a hostage negotiator with the FBI. And there was this famous um, negotiator, Gary Nesner. I highly recommend his book. Stolen for time. I get no, nothing. I'm not an Amazon affiliate. I don't get anything if you go buy his book, but it's just really good. But it's it, it. What I learned from him was, what are we trying to do during our daily police interactions? I'm not talking about high pressure ones. Just daily interactions. It's one or two things. One, we're trying to build positive interactions with the public, and being nice to people. And nice and professional work hand in hand. It's not one or the other. You can be. Nice nice and be professional because it, this is what I say too when I teach recruits on day one to whatever we're servants and that's an honorable term we're fortunate enough to be servants to the other people that we live and serve in a city town or where have you but now you look at it at the other end of the spectrum where we have to take some sort of police action every one of us in our world of conflict management no matter who you are and your role is you have to have I think personally and I'm only speaking here on behalf of myself you have to have a basic understanding of psychology and what I learned from Gary first and others then was, so if we're taking police action, what do we want to achieve? Voluntary, right? That's what police want to achieve in those situations and all the time. Why? Because that means we're getting people to do what we want them to do voluntarily. If it's not voluntary, what is it? Easiest question I ever ask anybody, involuntary. And what does that involve? Force. And what happens when force is used? People are probably going to get hurt or potentially get hurt, including the police, their partners, the person you're interacting with and potentially the public we don't want that but this is where these skills come in with a little bit of psychology because the way we describe this so what do we want to do influence a positive behavioral change to gain voluntary compliance that's ingrained everywhere now does it always work no not necessarily but then what we do is and same thing like mediation one-on-one -on -one training like i had many years ago or any of these conflict resolution trainings it's the idea of constantly as the officer side because who can you control yourself you can influence others, but you control yourself. It's that idea of asking yourself at all times, are your actions helping or hindering achieve that goal of voluntary compliance? Mm -hmm. And again, I don't want to go too much into this because one other thing I, I would hear people say all the time, we want de-escalation training. No, you don't. De-escalation is part of the training. The goal, though, is what I just said. De-escalation helps you achieve the goal. De-escalation is not the goal because you use de-escalation techniques to get that voluntary compliance. And it's also the last thing just to what Kirk said too, is how truly unique and tough it is on a daily basis. Because like the way you said it, Kirk, whether it's the domestic dispute, you go up to a family dispute or even a person in a mental health crisis, 
And quite often what's the case, somebody's calling them because they can't handle it. And it's probably been years in the making, yet they expect the police to come up on that scene and resolve it right away. And overall, they do a pretty darn good job, but also not every time it goes well. And the last I'll say on that is, how do we measure success? I think it's truly important from the research side of things, because just because it didn't work in that situation doesn't mean the approach or the skills don't work. Just it's nothing in this world of human interactions is 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? I think that both Kirk and Jeff said, I mean, I, I agree with almost everything they said. I would only expand upon what Jeff said and say, voluntary compliance isn't always the goal. Compliance isn't always the goal. Sometimes you wanna solve a problem, not make people comply with what you want, right? Police don't always want compliance. They want compliance when they need compliance. And, and I think you'd agree with that, right? Sometimes police are called upon to solve a range of problems. And sometimes there aren't two, pro two parties. Sometimes there are multiple parties and sometimes there's only one party. There's a, there's a person walking down the street, knocking out um, headlights of cars, you know, and the police officer has to intervene. And you can say that's a conflict. Um, is there a, a law enforcement a uh, component to this? Of course there is. And do you want compliance? Yes. Are you gonna make an arrest? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's a summons. Maybe it's just, you know, I used a bad example, something else that's lesser. Maybe it's just stop what you're doing. Maybe it's a warning. Maybe it's a summons, maybe it's an arrest. But I think I would say police are called upon to solve a range of problems. And sometimes that involves helping parties resolve a dispute that they have. Sometimes it means working with one party to figure out how to de-escalate a situation and get compliance. And sometimes it's just, you know, that traffic light that's been broken for six months. Finally, um, a neighborhood association has called the police and said, if you don't fix this, somebody's gonna get killed. And I'm telling you, this is a safety problem. It's not just a Department of Transportation problem. Should the police get into that? My answer to that is yes, they should. They should see that as a safety problem. Um, I do think that it's very important to realize that when police show up, they don't necessarily know what they're going to. So they show up wearing multiple hats, assess the situation, determine whether there is a safety risk involved that's imminent, determine whether there's a crime involved, determine whether there are resolutions that do not have to do with enforcement. Um, so it's very much a critical analysis uh, approach, a communication skills requirement, and then all those other things that we talked about. I, I think I opened by opening the door and saying, I think that anybody who works or interacts with the public in any way could benefit by conflict management skills. And I believe that. I would like to also underscore that the distinction that police have from everyone else who works with the public is that police have a, I was gonna say a sign here, but they have a shield here that basically silently communicates or else. Right? I'm here to talk to you to get you to move to the other side of the street or else. I'm here to ask you to turn your music down. I'm here to ask you to whatever it is or else. I have something in my back pocket that probably most people who interact with the public don't have. They may have, or I'll call the police, but there's an enforcement and a, a ability to limit somebody's liberty that nobody else in society has. And that changes the dynamic and always will. Thank you, Susan. Uh, since we are talking to conflict resolvers here about conflict management, I wonder if, and you've already started talking about this a little bit, but drill down a little bit more on some of the basic conflict resolution skills um, that are probably 
of most value and most drawn upon by police officers. How about we go in reverse order? I'll, I'll jump in first and say, um, it is a wondrous thing when you see the light bulb go on in a police officer who realizes that um, listening can be just an extraordinary activity and listening without initially judging as much as possible, listening with an open mind. It's very hard for someone who's there to enforce the law to not be looking for, have you crossed a line or not crossed a line, but active listening, non-judgment, problem um, solution generation, um, trying to help when it's possible, if you're at a meeting, you know, whatever the setting is where it's possible to help generate options rather than dictate options. These are, these are classic conflict management skills. Um, and, and I think being able to ask questions, you know, I always tell officers that if you know two questions, you can, you can pretty much help all disputes. All you have to do is keep asking what, what happened? What, 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 what do you want? What, 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 and then why? That's all you need to ask and you'll be fine. And if you get stuck and people are arguing and the, the emotions are flying, just remember to keep asking what and why, and you'll see your way through this. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll add to that too. I guess I'm always gonna be in the middle. <laughs> which I like you because I get to hear what someone already said and I can add to that. Thank you can you, start Susan. next time. <laughs> no, 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 it's all right. Um, it, it, it's a great question. And my, my first answer while Susan started talking is it's the same skills that all of you were taught. And I saw in the chat box here too, like, and during them, the, the pre-calls when we were setting up for this and going over things, one of the things that I said I wanted to say during it, so I can throw it out now too, is when we talk about training, I don't, it, this is anecdotally, but I think arguably cops get more training than many of the people on here that are mm -hmm. conflict resolution professionals. No question. And, yeah, right. Like, and, and I think it was somebody asked me, um, I, I wrote in the chat box, the amount of hours that I know in the NYPD, uh, among others, just while they're in the academy is well more than what the five-day basic mediation training course is. And here's the thing too, a lot of these in these academies it's not just these one-offs, it's throughout the whole time because we know these are perishable skills. But now what are the skills that we're talking about? Like, um, Susan, you said active listening skills, right? How important listening is, and I always stress, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, listening is not passive. There's an active element to it. And a silly, shameless plug, it's also nonverbal communication. And how important is that? I wrote over 300 pages on it for my doctorate. It's, they have to work together. But here, again, it goes back to what the, a lot of the work that I'm involved in currently in policing is for themselves. If you want to have an influence over other people, you want to be able to de-escalate them, you need to be practicing it yourself. And I saw in there in the comment box, like Rod, um, you brought up a really good comment, and it's a rabbit hole we can go down maybe a little bit later, but just for a brief moment, how cops are taught to use their command voice. Yeah. Command voice is very, very important. They're in charge. Police are in charge in a situation. I tell people, you don't like that. You don't have to like it, but they're there to help resolve, work together. As Susan, you explained it earlier, sometimes, but command voice in these trainings that I've been involved in too, is when we, these trainings, by the way, they have to be interactive when we talk about these skills, which I learned the first time I did a mediation training, how awesome it was. It wasn't death by PowerPoint. You constantly got called on constantly because that's where you got to realize, wait, do I I really know what they're saying. And when they call on you to demonstrate, well, wait, I don't know as much as I thought. But even with command, command voice, it can be aggressive or it can be influential. And that's the difference of the voice tone. But if you're not cool, calm, and collected inside, when you're using, again, just as the one example, that command voice, you're going to come across sounding like a jerk. And what happens? People don't like listening to jerks. And if your job is to get them to, yet again, and I, I know there's more too, but it, to voluntarily comply, this is where it's all the little pieces, but using them the right effective way based on the context at the moment, because it's different during the beginning of the interaction compared to the end. So the, the key um, is the self-regulation yet again. And I, I'll say it later too, but a lot of these skills isn't just for the police interacting with the public, making sure we use it with each other internally. And mm -hmm. that internal culture of, 
if we want to build trust and respect with the public, we've got to do it in-house before we even go out on the street. Last thing I'll say, um, and I'll throw it to you, Kirk, is one of the things I love doing whenever I do any of my trainings, even outside, forget about policing, is where you're talking about these negotiation skills as well. And it's like, you know, who's in charge, but to what degree? And I always say, if you're a great negotiator, not a non-police person, okay, let's do a quick scenario. Was that a sign for me? Someone just muted me. Maria, I'm wrapping it up. It's a short- It's like, very subtle. <laughs> it wasn't subtle at all. All right, I, was, I speak fast, I speak even faster. My point was <laughs> the scenarios for everybody here, take a quick five second moment once I'm done talking. Imagine if you were in this scenario and I said, use your awesome police, or, sorry, your negotiation, mediation, conflict skills. And imagine you pulled me over, you saw me on my cell phone and you say, excuse me, however you do the intro, I notice you on your cell phone. I need to see your license and registration. What if I say no? Now, how are you going to try to get me to voluntarily comply? Because you can't go around arresting everybody that's not giving you their driver's license. And that's where the real world of these skills used on a daily basis. And I love using that as an example. No one likes getting a ticket. No one wants to get a ticket. People tried to say they weren't on their phone. And that's where truly the art and the science brings out the beauty of peaceful compliance or what have you, but mm -hmm. I'll mute myself now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll follow up. Um, I'll start with, so two things, two themes. Uh, one is to follow up on Susan's theme of listening. Just, I can't understate the importance. And the other is confidence slash faith in training and experience. So I'll address both separately. Listening is not simply just allowing someone else to talk, right? Just being quiet and let them talk. <laughs> and uh, it took me years to learn how to listen. And anyone here who is a parent, I have three kids, they're all adults. You know, I had my first child when I was six. That's why I look so young, but uh, I'm just joking. My three kids are all adults. And if you're a parent, you know how long it takes you to learn how to listen, right? The last people that we kind of listen to are our kids and because what well, we touched on we certainly have something in our back pocket right you have to comply you're my you're my child you're my adult whoever you are but um you know listening as opposed to just letting someone talk i won't quite often means i do not want to because and i it was a revelation it took me years when i realized when somebody said to me quite often I'm not going to do that, whatever the case. My first reaction was, you know, I'm the police. You can't say that to me. I'll show you, you know, we're, I'm not going to lose here. Totally unnecessary because what that person was, was communicating was I really don't want to, I'm a little fearful to explain to you why I don't want to. And if I could engage them in conversation uh, and find out why, then we could resolve this in some way that would not involve the use of force. Everybody wants to go home and, and so forth. So, you know, I, I think the listening aspect is so important. Uh, I listen to my students here in law school. You have to. I learn from my students. And it's not a matter of just letting someone raise their hand and saying, oh, well, they spoke in class today. No, that's not important. You have to listen to what they're saying, understand what their perception is, understand what they understood I said. So it's just such an important skill this active listening skill and being able to kind of decipher that and understand what they really mean. Can't stress that enough, what the other person means. The other is, uh, and, I, and the reason why I mentioned confidence and meaning faith in your training and experience. Someone made a comment in the chat about police officers being trained uh, to uh, give aggressive commands and so forth. Uh, and sometimes using profanity in doing so. And Jeff touched on this with the command voice. That's not the command voice, right? So when, what do we do when we are perhaps fearful or we just don't have any training? We revert back to what's very basic, right? I'm going to muscle you or overpower you. And I don't mean that necessarily physically, but emotionally or with my voice. That's actually more than likely a person who is not relying on their training or does not, or perhaps doesn't have faith 
in their training or their experience to kind of resolve this or, or get someone, you know, to have someone to comply because it's a fallback point. And, you know, with regards to uh, me, any form of mediation, you have to give it a chance. Those of you who are experienced uh, arbitrators and mediators, you know that this takes hours and hours sometimes, right? And you just can't give up. Look at your watch and say, oh, we've been here 10 minutes. It's not working. This is all right. You know, so it takes time and you have to have confidence in the process and confidence that, uh, that the folks that you're dealing with are human beings and they want a positive resolution to whatever is going on also. The positive resolution doesn't always mean that they will get their way, but they want a resolution where nobody's getting arrested. There's not bloodshed and you know, it didn't just completely ruin their day. <laughs> you know, not everybody's always going to be happy, but folks can walk away feeling that an issue was resolved. And that requires just a lot of confidence. Now, I didn't receive the training that police officers receive now in 1984. Um, I, the training I received was kind of on the job training, right? I would. I didn't identify. get there till '85. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, <laughs> I would identify. Or could you, you know, hold on to that for just one second oh, while me, I give that me, second geez, code word? Uh, the second code word is cops. C O P S. Continue. If you couldn't guess that one. You will get no CLE credit. I'm just going <laughs> to throw that out there. So, Stick around. There's one more, folks. I think there's one more coming too. I just wanted to mention. You know, the training I received was I would identify the seasoned police officer who seemed to be able to take control and resolve disputes and, and mediate and have positive outcomes and try to learn from that person. Not learn by engaging in conversation and you know, asking what is your methodology, but just literally observing and trying to emulate that, which is not necessarily effect effective in doing so. Uh, but you, you kind of see enough people do it long enough at some point you start to gain a little bit of confidence and you also realize i'm doing things the hard way every interaction i have there's always a lot of yelling there's a lot of bad feelings every interaction this other person has mm -hmm. they walk away and the person wants to bake them an apple pie and bring it to the precinct right you know and what's wrong with me i'm a nice person too and you realize it's because that they had a certain skill set yeah. and they employed that skill set so those are the two, listening and confidence and faith in training and experiences, I think are huge. And what was alluded to earlier is that police are in so many different uh, units and on different teams, and these skills come into play a little differently depending on the team. So hostage negotiators, you know, as Jeff was mentioning, you know, spend tons of time waiting, uh, listening, uh, community police officers uh, do it a little differently. And those who work with the youth um, do it even more differently. They may have to learn the jargon that's um, being used by the kids in order to be relevant in their interaction. So all of these points are really wonderful. Um, so we've been talking about training and education here. Um, does becoming a police officer and managing conflicts begin even before one becomes a police officer. We've a lot has been written about preparing officers to do the job. And sometimes um, it comes down to recruitment and selection. What difference does it make who's recruited or selected? I mean, it's, sometimes it goes to that question, are we born or are we made? But some individuals are probably going to be a lot better uh, than others. So uh, some thoughts around recruitment and selection. Uh, are they, how important is the recruitment and selection? And we've heard a lot about um, the importance of our officers um, mirroring the communities that they're serving. Um, so I, I'm gonna throw it out. Um, what difference does recruitment and selection make? Jeff, I think it's yours. <laughs> Yeah, they, I think it was the only really topic I didn't want to answer to, so I guess I'll make mine short because so I, have really... a, I have a secret. I have reached out to Kirk on this one, so I'm going to huh? be happy to turn it over to Kirk. Well, Kirk, I'll just say one sentence. It's 
What do we want our police officers to look like? And I'm not talking about physics. What do we want them to look like? Because that's how the recruitment has to be done. What we as a community value, the abilities and skills that we want our police to possess. Reach out to those people that, Maria, that you said intrinsically have it, but it absolutely can be trained. Um, people can get better at it as well. So just because maybe you have the heart for it and you don't necessarily have the skills, come, we can train you. But also, if you're already good at this, good, come, and we can make you even better at what you're already great at. That's all I have. This is a great question. There's certainly a lot of folks think about this, you know, starting with uh, your your latter point about police officers living uh, or from the communities they serve. Uh, the answer is not as easy as one would think, you know, the natural and what seems to be intuitive, of course, is that, you know, if I live in community X, you know, I would love to see people policing or delivering those services who are from community X without getting into details, we've had some problems in the past of people who, with, with police officers who are from a particular com community, not necessarily taking action or becoming a little bit too involved, right? So it's a double-edged sword. Uh, broadly speaking, very broadly speaking, the police should somehow, uh, I believe, reflect the community that they serve, very broadly speaking. Does it mean they necessarily have to be from that particular area? Well, there are rules about that, and there's a reason for that. There are a lot of conflicts that can mm -hmm. that can arise that can really have serious consequences. So it's a it's a very it's it's an extensive conversation. That being said, the police department should look like the police department, you know, those that they they serve. No two ways about it. Uh, you know, um, so that's one uh, issue. The other is, you know, life experience, education, and so forth versus not having that basically age, right? Was I an effective recruit at 21 or would I have been more effective if I was say 27 with more yes. life experience and having <laughs> uh, worked? So there's two ways to approach it. I think certainly, um, and, and we see this in academia uh, and students who come to the table, so to speak, with some life experience, perhaps having worked and so forth, they certainly have a different mindset uh, towards their education, they see a certain amount of uh, value, they bring a certain richness to the classroom. However, the other uh, person who is like myself, 21 years old, well, guess what? That person is a clay, a piece of clay, and you can actually mold them if they are receptive. And that's the key. If they're receptive, this person can be trained. How do we know this? We see this in the military. We see it here in law school, right? We don't require law students to have a certain level of life experience. As a matter of fact, the overwhelming majority of my day students don't have a lot of life experience. And they graduate and they go on to work for Fortune 500 law firms. They're handling multi-billion dollar mergers and so forth. They're, they're actually doing, they're representing clients. They're doing well. And I think, so, you know, if you, you look at it, on one side, it's great to have someone who hasn't had the opportunity to uh, form biases, uh, biases, to be so biased, perhaps they won't buy in to certain types of training, or they you know, just uh, happen to think already, they're really uh, entrenched in their beliefs. And I think I was uh, someone who was a lot more receptive because I was, a, you know, I was kind of empty, right? I didn't have all these life experiences. The other side is having that adult in the room someone who can uh, understand the value, uh, see people as people, as opposed to, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones. I mean, the first people I didn't call Mr. and Mrs. were the people that I approached outside the police academy. Up until that time, everyone was either, you know, I still lived at home and everyone was very much an adult to me until I graduated the police academy. I was like, oh, I guess I'm adult now, like everyone else. So, you know, you need, so I, and I think the answer is a mix. It is a mix. The key being folks who are, who understand the mission of policing, and that's an entire, entirely another uh, discussion, right? What is the mission of policing, but who understand the mission as dictated by our elected officials and who are receptive to carrying out that mission as long as the, you have those two components, I'm of the opinion I would rather see a diverse department. 
some of the folks who haven't been fully uh, developed yet, and then other folks that have life experience and bring that uh, to the table. What's interesting is when I believe, I believe, I won't say it for a fact, that when most police departments recruit, we're going to hire a thousand people. Here are the parameters. Let's just get up to that number. And perhaps we should approach it a little bit like we do in academia. We're going to bring in a class of 300. Well, let's take a look at who we're bringing in, right? Let's have a diverse class. Let's have some folks with a graduate school background. Let's have some folks that have only been to undergraduate school. Let's have some first generation professionals. You know, let's have a nice mix because we want to have a rich classroom experience. So perhaps recruitment should be a little bit more thoughtful, right? Where departments develop these, these very diverse classes. Now, some of that, as I mentioned, may be taking place already, but I'm, I'm not aware of it necessarily. It's usually kind of just like, let's, here are the guidelines. This is, you know, the parameters. And once we reach that number, we have a full class. So that's a rather long-winded answer to your question, but I hope it's helpful. And internally, there are some additional guidelines in recruiting officers for special units. Um, for example, for the hostage team, and you're not going to put a 21-year-old on that team. I don't know, Jeff, if you want to address some of the additional kinds of characteristics that they look for you know, in terms of age and qualities for, for that team. Um, yeah, I guess just briefly, because I've done some research studies on it, um, people Google it, you'll see what hostage negotiators, I think we spoke with like 300 of them, of what they think makes good qualities for them and others to be good negotiators. It is that experience. You've got to have some life experience. As I was writing to, uh, back to, I think, um, Lewis Cohen in the chat box too, how important that term empathy is. And the idea of a good negotiator or anyone in that regard, just, and I, I speak more police in general. Um, it's the idea of being able to handle, use these skills in a really awful, awful situation, even in the policing world. And it's that idea of with the empathy, it's yet again, and I, I, I'm repeating myself purposely, it's got to be start with the self. And where you spring, again, you, you have that basic understanding of psychology. The more you understand and can manage your own thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, that makes what Kirk, Kirk said earlier, confidence, self-efficacy. It keeps you cool during chaos. And then that's what's contagious. So you want to be contagious on the person whose world is upside down. And that's why I don't care if it's a, a criminal, a, a citizen, a community member or not. It's that mindset. I'm here to help that person get uh, the most peaceful resolution as possible. And that's where I'd say it's all, the trunk of the tree is crisis conflict communication. The branches are like a huge trunk of a branch is policing. Like you said, Maria, there's in smaller branches, patrol detectives, special victims detectives, the hostage negotiators. It's still that basic understanding of that trunk of the tree is crisis communication. And the roots of the tree though is the basic understanding of psychology. Can I jump in here and just say, um, just very briefly, there, there's a phrase that's been used for the last 20 years in recruitment around and police departments around the country that police departments want to increasingly recruit in the spirit of service rather than the spirit of adventure. And I think if you, if you look at police departments around the country, you'll notice a difference in the posters and the advertisements. Are you seeing a lot of toys that excite people and you want to drive that fast car. And you, you know, in the mid 80s, when I came to the NYPD, the recruitment poster was a NYPD car that was clearly sort of skidding because it was going so fast and it was sort of, you want to take one for a test drive. That was, that was recruiting in the spirit of adventures and posters with helicopters and harbor unit and you know, scuba divers. So you could see if you join the NYPD, you could just do all these incredible things versus mostly the way police departments around the country now, forward thinking ones are recruiting in the spirit of service, emphasizing in a variety of ways. It's harder to show it visually, but emphasizing that what we want to do is help people serve the public. As Jeff said, you are a public servant you are not a public leader, you're a public servant, servant leader. And, and you wanna attract people who have that philosophy. 
I'll also go out on a limb because I'm believing we have people from around the country on this and maybe you can influence your various municipalities. If I had my way, nobody would join a police department until their brain was fully developed at 26. If that's what we are looking for in that's what we look at when we talk about raising the age efforts. They're going from 16 to 18 to 21. The brain, everybody pretty much agrees it's 26. And if I think I'm sending you out there in the world with a gun to make life and death decisions, you're not in the military where you're being told to do something all the time. And you're not, you're not in the army in, or voting or all these other places where you can do things at 18. You're making life and death decisions very quickly. I'd like your brain to be fully developed. And to have experienced life as, yeah. you know, I yeah. often heard for the hostage teams, wanting someone who's had an opportunity to love and cry and fear and yeah. um, Absolutely. to live, um, to Absolutely. have all those emotions that Jeff's been referring to around empathy and- Right. Um, Maria, yeah. may, I, may I ask Susan a question? Mm -hmm. So I have a colleague who uh, had a client who used to love to say devil's alley cat. So I'm going to play devil's alley cat here. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I agree, you know, I certainly don't know the science, but I remember, you know, I've read about, you know, when is an adult's brain fully formed? Are we holding the police to a standard that we don't hold other uh, persons in society to? And those yes. who- yes. Have a, um, Absolutely. So in other words, you know, I think the first thing I think of, of course, is lawyers, right? I, my, many yeah. of my students graduate before they're 26. And as you know, everyone in this call knows, a lawyer has the ability to, unfortunately, can really screw somebody's life up. Uh, or they can not, do- Not as much as a cop. Not as much as a cop. I, I beg to differ. Only because, only because, not that a cop can't do that but an ineffective counsel. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk about the loss of finances. The oh, it's loss terrible. Of liberty. It's a people, horrible thing. Yeah, there and are you people should, in Rikers Island You should Island have a supervisor. You should have a supervisor. You should, you're, you're going to college, then you're going to law school, you're 26 years old. That's, or 25 or 26. So you're at least an adult in my view. And I hope you're getting supervised when you're practicing for a while. But you're a cop and you're on the street with a gun at 21. I'm scared. I think Very police ha are supervised far. I mean, having lived in both worlds, police are supervised far heavier than lawyers. We turn lawyers loose um, when they pass the bar exam, even though they're really apprentices, right? For the most part, lawyers work alone all day. We have lawyers. You know, I see my students quite often. You know, they graduate in June. And I run into them in front of the courthouse. I'm a couple of blocks away, you know, in October, and they're representing clients. And you know, I don't want to say anything, but I'm like, oh my God, you know, I hope it's not a criminal matter. So, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, uh, so maybe the lawyer should be supervised more, but I'm, I'm not so I, that cops should be older. So, right, and I'm not disagreeing with you. <laughs> I, I'm definitely not disagreeing with you about police officers necessarily. I'm just wondering is this something that we should start thinking about in other areas of society? Probably. Are we just limiting, you know, why, yeah, why should probably. we limit this idea to, to, uh, to the police? And, you know, I was fortunate. You know, I talk about how young I was. I have to say I was fortunate that, and there are all, for several reasons, having you know, a father and a brother who went before me, uh, and having colleagues and supervisors who actually cared. Uh, you know, it just wasn't, please, I don't want anyone to think just willy-nilly I was out there figuring out on my own. I actually did have some colleagues and supervisors, you know, colleagues who had more experience who actually cared. And, and they would pull you aside and say, listen, this is the way you should do X. Now there's certainly a more robust way to, to indoctrinate folks and to train them. Uh, but I was very fortunate and someone put in, it was Dan Oates that put in the chat, you know, New York City Police Department has been around for so long and is considered one of the best police departments in the world. I don't know if I would have received that support in a smaller department or department that didn't have all the resources. But uh, you know, I think it's very interesting what, what you say, Susan, with regards to age and so forth. When I was hired, 
the majority of the folks, I think it's about 3,000 people that I was hired with, the majority of them, I, I bet you any amount of money, were under 25 at that time. There, there was mass hiring that occurred between, yeah. I guess, like uh, 1980 and maybe 86. The majority of my class, we were kids. Yeah. I, I remember that. I, this is wonderful. And, and Jeff would ask us to look at the science, right? Um, so um, we have a lot of work to do yet. Um, we're getting close to the end. And I wanted to, since this is a conflict-related um, event, um, end with a question on, a is there a role for conflict resolvers, particularly mediators, uh, in with respect to policing, is there a role that they can play? Uh, it's not uncommon to hear mediators encourage police officers to receive mediation training. Should mediators also be trained in police intervention? Uh, I could perhaps I'm share just one comment, which um, is relevant to last week when we held our monthly breakfast for conflict resolvers and Dan Shapiro from Harvard um, was a speaker. He, I had uh, arranged for him and two other scholars to come to New York in um, 2005 to sit through the NYPD hostage negotiation training for a week. And he said that that was one of the most meaningful weeks of his life in terms of uh, understanding conflict resolution and the power of the concepts used every day in some of the most difficult kinds of situations, hostage negotiation. So this was someone from our field, you know, having had that opportunity to sit in on the training. I'm wondering if you'd like to share some thoughts around, um, should mediators be trained in police intervention? I don't, think, I don't think mediators need to go through the six months of the police academy, but I think that um, citizen police academies, which are often, you know, um, once or twice a week for six weeks, or, um, you know, there's, there's a, actually a theater program that we have in New York where civilians and cops do improv together. Any, anytime you have an opportunity to walk in someone else's shoes, you understand their life a little bit better. And I would recommend those kinds of experiences for, for any member of the public um, there's great, it's not just misunderstanding, it's just lack of understanding through, because of lack of information about what police officers training is and what the experience is. So anytime you have an opportunity to do that, I think it's great. Other thoughts? I'll, uh, I'm sorry, Jeff, were you gonna go? Uh, I'll go after you, go ahead. Uh, sure, um, just following up on what Susan mentioned, I've heard nothing but fantastic things about citizens' uh, police academies. And, mm -hmm. you know, as Susan mentioned, a, that's a, a training light, right? Just to have an understanding and awareness of uh, policing and so forth, I, I think is, is huge. However, I'll be a little radical here. Uh, I think the real answer is at some point, we really need to think, to think about what do we mean when we talk about policing and the delivery of services that fall under that umbrella of policing? So quite often we think of, for here, we think of mediators different from police officers, different from mental health professionals and different from so forth. But perhaps we should come uh, get to a point where we understand that the civilian population needs an array of services and then there is some centralized hub that delivers this, these services. And those different people have different levels of training. Certainly one of those services is crime prevention and law enforcement. But as we've seen, our society is so complex and many, many other services. So this thing that we now call a precinct and a police department, maybe at some point in the future, that will be something different that encompasses a uniform uh, population and a civilian population. And in some areas they're cross-trained and some they're not, but this line this, of differentiation is, is blurred 
So there's kind of no need to think about, should we train this person because they are not a member of the police department? Well, all these people are a member of whatever we call this thing that delivers all these services. So that would be my, my answer. And when I'm, you know, God for a day or something, I'll, I'll work that all out. But, uh, but I think that's eventually what we'll see in our future. I don't know when, but uh, we're probably gonna move in that direction. Thank you. And Jeff, you have the final word here. Woo. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'll try to make it epic. Uh, it, honestly, just the, the way I look at it too is for the person in the audience that's just interested in the types of like police type training, go to, um, to register because you can go to some of these police conferences. Check it out for yourself. See if there's like different types of police trainings um, that there's private organizations do all over the country. Yeah. And you apply to them and you explain why you want to do it. And you articulate how it's connected to law enforcement. You're a mediator in a community center. Quite often they allow people. Um, I know like a lot of the trainings I do, and sometimes they're free, sometimes they're not. So I'm not going to sell any of these, but I take my police training. And when I teach it to the, to the public or the conflict resolution field, I say, this is basically what police get across the country. When I train it, I slightly modify it, but we actually do some of those real scenarios because A, it's a bit of fun. If you're not pleased to try and say, well, how am I going to convince somebody to give up their driver's license? But the last thing I will say on that too is, and I wanted to make sure I threw that in, like I try to be a bit, I don't know, friendlier, happier, we're laughing on this. I also, I'm not minimizing any of this work. It's really, really stressful. The work that we all do and something I learned as, I, as I've gotten older and really near the end of my career is we've got to, and this is my message to everybody, you've got to look after yourself. I've seen too many people in police and in conflict resolution. They do such a great job of helping others. Don't do it at the detriment to your own health. It's just not fair. And if other people deserve such good kindness that you're giving them, make sure you're online and sometimes push yourself to the front of the line. And sometimes at the end of the day, you got to be able to say this was good enough. With that, thank you. The importance of self-care. We have a new mayor in New York who has been reminding us of the importance of meditation. At my college, we're now offering a course on meditation and mediation for our students. So um, thanks for the reminder. And I could have spent another three days with this team. This has just been a wonderful, wonderful um, group of colleagues to spend this time with. We uh, need to give you the final code word for your CLE, and it Drum is roll. empathy. How's that, uh, <laughs> Jeff? <laughs> empathy. Yeah. Uh, and with that, um, we need to say goodbye and um, look forward to future sessions on this really important topic. I can think of no more important uh, context in which conflict resolution and conflict management skills are used. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this amazing, awesome session. Thank you, Maria. Thanks.